and that his legacy was the peaceful South Africa that we see today. Well, in the place where he lived before his imprisonment, Soweto, the township outside Johannesburg, we can cross now to my colleague, Will Ross. And Will, if you can, just give us a sense of the mood there amongst people who shared that township, who lived in what was once Nelson Mandela's neighborhood. Yeah, well, there's an immense feeling of pride, I th think, here about the life that Nelson Mandela lived. And just down on the corner there, that crowd has been growing steadily over the past hour, and it looks as though it's going to probably turn into a, a massive crowd. They've been singing uh, songs from the liberation years, from the 1980s. The one they're singing now, talking about how long will the struggle continue, and the, Nelson Mandela's uh, name is actually coming out in that song. Other songs have been about other anti-apartheid heroes. So the mood here, while of course there is a lot of sorrow and sadness, the mood really is one of celebrating his life. And you can see uh, the, the crowd has just moved down the street now, so I'm sure as it moves around this area of Soweto, and we've heard different music coming from houses in this particular neighbourhood, um, I'm sure that, that it's, it's going to swell. And there have been other events going on around South Africa. We understand in Cape Town, prayers have been held, led by Archbishop Desmond Tutu in a church in Cape Town there. Um, but here in, in, in Soweto, I think really there is a feeling that, you know, this is where he was from. The house, which is just about 100 metres behind me, the house where he lived during the 1940s and early 1950s before he went underground, that's now a museum. Um, but Nelson Mandela, when he was released from prison, he said he only really felt that he was finally free when he was back home in that house. So an extraordinary special place for him, but also for the people here. And I think we're going to see the crowds gather here and, and swell, Gabriel. Well, what do people where you are feel about uh, Mandela's legacy, his, his aim of creating a united, prosperous and non-racial South Africa? How far do they feel that aim has been achieved? How far do they feel South Africa still needs to work to fulfill his legacy? Well, I think everybody realises there's an extraordinary long journey still to go. Um, of course, he achieved incredible things during his lifetime and especially when he, uh, leading up to when he was the president and then when he was the president, but nobody expected things to change overnight. And just in the last few months, uh, if you look at the extraordinary strikes that have taken place in the, the gold mining sector, and I went down to visit some of the people who, who were living in pretty deplorable conditions there, being paid very low salaries, working kilometres underground, and I think everybody here still realises there is an extraordinary gulf between the rich and the poor and the journey actually from the northern suburbs of Johannesburg to here in Soweto you do pass through and you see some um, very very squalid really tin shack areas um, where you can see people are living in extraordinary poverty and of course there was a, 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 a huge amount of work to be done after 1994 that work was begun by President Mandela who only stayed in office for one term but there is also a feeling amongst some South Africans that uh, some of the work is being undermined because the the elite are becoming very rich and the people who are becoming very rich in South Africa are a tiny few whilst the masses are still really struggling battling against poverty, even though the, the, the fight to achieve democracy was won, um, some of the tributes we're getting from people paying tribute to Nelson Mandela, they're referring to this need to keep his battle going, the battle to ensure that the country is not only free, but also uh, f free from oppression, but also free from, from poverty. And uh, those are the, kind of well, the kinds of things that Jacob Zoom has mentioned, but also uh, Thabo Mbeki, the former president. Well, Ross, in Soweto, thanks for now. Uh, you talked about the tributes coming in from local people in Soweto, tributes also coming in from leaders around the world. Here's what British Prime Minister David Cameron had to say last night when the news became known outside Downing Street. Tonight, one of the brightest lights of our world has gone out. Nelson Mandela was not just a hero of our time, but a hero of all time. The first president of a free South Africa, 
a man who suffered so much for freedom and justice, and a man who through his dignity and through his triumph inspired millions. The strongest impression of all when you met him was of his extraordinary compassion and generosity and forgiveness. Tonight, families across Britain will mourn with his family and everyone in South Africa. Your greatest son has moved millions, and I believe that his inspiration for the future will be every bit as powerful as the extraordinary things that he achieved in his remarkable life. Thank you. And in, and in Washington, President Obama, of course, America's first black president, talked about how Nelson Mandela had inspired him personally. At his trial in 1964, Nelson Mandela closed his statement from the dock, saying, I have fought against white domination, and I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve. But if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. And Nelson Mandela lived for that ideal and he made it real. He achieved more than could be expected of any man. And today he's gone home. And we've lost one of the most influential, courageous, and profoundly good human beings that any of us will share time with on this earth. He no longer belongs to us. He belongs to the ages. Through his fierce dignity and unbending will to sacrifice his own freedom for the freedom of others, Madiba transformed South Africa and moved all of us. His journey from a prisoner to a president embodied the promise that human beings and countries can change for the better. His commitment to transfer power and reconcile with those who jailed him set an example that all humanity should aspire to, whether in the lives of nations or our own personal lives. And the fact that he did it all with grace and good humor and an ability to acknowledge his own imperfections only makes the man that much more remarkable. As he once said, uh, I'm not a saint unless you think of a saint as a sinner who keeps on trying. Barack Obama there. Well, this first day of mourning will culminate Saturday week in a state funeral. In between then, we'll have a national day of mourning in the large stadium outside Johannesburg, where Nelson Mandela, in fact, gave his first speech after being freed from prison. There will be days of lying in state and then, of course, heads of state from around the world. And we at BBC News will be bringing you all of that news as it comes. But for now, back to you. So that's Gabriel Gatehouse in Johannesburg, and that's uh, not far from our bureau in Johannesburg, in Houghton. Uh, the flames uh, lit in the street, but as we heard uh, from Will Ross, it's likely that large numbers will now make their way to Houghton, uh, which is where uh, Mandela died. And uh, of course, that scene there, as we were hearing from Gabriel, all the uh, morning to come, the lying in state, the state funeral uh, and the burial in Kunu. But today, this morning, as people wake up in South Africa and across the world to this uh, news, a day for reflection on the life of an extraordinary uh, man and a day for people in South Africa to gather to celebrate uh, the man who their president last night uh, described as a son and a father to the nation. Well, back in 1997, our colleague uh, George Alagaya interviewed Mr. Mandela shortly before he finished his term as president of South Africa. Yes, and for the BBC's Hard Talk programme, uh, he asked Nelson Mandela how he would like to be remembered by his public. Well, it is better to leave that to the public. And uh, it would be arrogance for me to say 
this is how I want to be remembered. I have now, I've lived my life. I've made my mistakes. I hope I've made achievements as, as well. But it is for the world to decide how they will remember me on the basis of my record. It would be arrogant for me to say this is how I would like to be remembered. W will you miss the struggle, the politics? You mean uh, when I am dead or uh, when I've just stepped down? When you step down, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> I will be there. I will still be participating. I will remain a member of the ANC and whatever service they want me to, ca to carry out, I'll obey. So I'll be uh, right there, except that I won't have any office. <clears throat> That hard talk will be run in full in about an hour and a quarter on BBC World News. Now, we're joined by Paul Boateng, the former British High Commissioner to South Africa there from 2005 to 2009, Lord Boateng. Uh, let me ask you about one particular story you've got to tell, share with us. You were sitting at the premiere of the film of Walk to Freedom here in London last night when all this was beginning to happen. It must have been quite extraordinary. Indeed, I was in Leicester Square at the Odeon. Um, Nelson Mandela's daughters uh, were with us in the audience together with the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. And then suddenly my phone started to go. This was, you know, a halfway into the film. It's a gripping, remarkable film. Uh, I ignored it, of course, but it kept, kept on going. I kept on ignoring it. Then my daughter, who was sitting next to me, uh, it was on some sort of Twitter feed, and she nudged me, and there the news was. Uh, uh, and I had to leave the auditorium at once. I had to do an interview for uh, the, world, uh, the World Tonight. But when I came back, people still didn't know. And then it was announced, um, after the film had come to an end. And there was this audible gasp, there were tears, uh, very many people crying, and there's this huge sense when we'd seen the full richness of this man's life and his contribution, we'd seen it with his daughters who are portrayed and who, with Winnie, suffered so much, and we just had this sense of loss, that there was a, there was a, a, a vacuum, a, a, a moral vacuum now that he had gone, not just in uh, South Africa, uh, but uh, uh, but globally. It was a really incredible moment. And uh, you've watched politics in this country, in many countries around the world over the last few decades. What was it about Nelson Mandela? I mean, give us a few examples of the things that made him special, the, the bounds that he transcended, the things he made possible. He was first and foremost, and we should never forget this, an activist and a freedom fighter. I mean, he led the ANC in the course of the armed struggle. This was a man who had to bury his own gun uh, uh, shortly before he was actually arrested. Um, you know, he was a freedom fighter and an activist. But at the same time, he had this capacity, he had this uh, ability to love his enemies, really, to love them. And he reflected that in his life, in his politics. Love not just as a sentiment, but as a strategy, a strategy of transformation. And that was very, very special. So this was not just any other politician, not just any other statesman even, a man of values, a man of vision, but love, the embodiment of love at its heart. Uh, but Lord Boateng, I'm looking back and I've managed to start rereading bits of Anthony mm. Sampson's profile of Mandela, it's his biography, but actually with, uh, with Mandela's approval, Indeed. Mandela went through it, looking through all the documents over 30 years. He says the myth of Mandela is so powerful that it actually blurs the realities. I think the wonderful thing about the reality is that Nelson Mandela illustrates in his life uh, the capacity to be engaged, uh, to be a disciplined and focused part of a wider movement, but nevertheless, despite everything that happened to him and to his uh, family, and Winnie's courage and sacrifice cannot be uh, overlooked. But blurring the realities, that's to what Samson that. says, based, well, is based on all the documents. Th the reality is that this is a freedom fighter and activist who at the same time had this capacity to love and to forgive. That combination is extremely rare. In fact, it's, it is unique. Uh, 
Well, is, is there anyone who, who comes even shoulders high on that no ability one. to figure it out? No one in my experience as a politician, as a diplomat, as someone that's lived through this period, except, of course, remember that he was part of a trio. Uh, Oliver Tambo, Walter Sisulu, um, Albertina uh, Adelaide and Winnie. These were remarkable leaders and they took collective decisions. They were part of a disciplined movement which had vision and values. And what the ANC will be doing now is looking at itself today and saying how can we recapture that vision? How can we once again embrace and embody those values? That's happening in South Africa now. I'm an optimist about South Africa. Uh, in his death, I believe he will cause that country to focus and to live out the promise of the rainbow nation that he was central to the creation of. Lord Paul Button, thanks very much indeed for Thank being you. with us for the moment. Thank you. Well, around the world, flags are flying at half-mast and tributes are being paid. So the to the man credited with achieving South Africa's peaceful transition from whites-only rule. Yes, look at, let's look now at some of that reaction. The UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon called him a giant for justice and a down-to-earth human inspiration. Other leaders, stars and celebrities have also been remembering Nelson Mandela. Here's our diplomatic correspondent, Bridget Kendall. A towering figure, his statue already a landmark in central London. And it didn't take long after his death was confirmed for the first tributes to Nelson Mandela to appear. Street, the flags, British and South African, were flown at half mast. David Cameron lost no time in emerging to pay his respects. Tonight, one of the brightest lights of our world has gone out. Nelson Mandela was not just a hero of our time, but a hero of all time. Across the Atlantic in Washington, the flags at the White House also flew at half-staff. In mourning, President Obama said, for the loss of a close friend, an incomparable liberator, and an inspiration for freedom. I am one of the countless millions who drew inspiration from Nelson Mandela's life. My very first political action, the first thing I ever did that involved an issue or a policy or politics was a protest against apartheid. And in New York, the passing of a great leader was mourned both in Times Square and at the United Nations, where diplomats in the Security Council paused in silent tribute. When I thanked him for his life's work, he insisted the credit belonged to others. I will never forget his selflessness and deep sense of shared purpose. On the other side of the world, as Asia woke up to the news, further tributes poured in. In Beijing, he was praised as an old friend of China. The Indian Prime Minister called him a giant among men and a true Gandhian. And there was this from Japan's Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe. He fought for the abolition of apartheid with a strong will, said Mr Abe. On nation building, he made a major achievement with focus on the reconciliation of people. He was a great leader. And from the many people from all walks of life who met Nelson Mandela, former US President Bill Clinton said he'd lost a true friend Former British Prime Minister Tony Blair praised him as a great man who'd made racism not just immoral but stupid. The great US boxing legend Muhammad Ali called Mandela a symbol of forgiveness. Former footballer David Beckham said the world had lost a true gentleman. And South African actress Charlie Theron said that though Mandela would be missed, his impact would live forever. By chance, just before news came of his death, fans were gathering for the London premiere of the new biopic of his life, Mandela Long Walk to Freedom. Among those who came to it, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. It wasn't till the credits rolled that the news of the death was announced, leaving the audience shocked and somber, including Prince William. It's obviously extremely sad and tragic news. Um, we're just reminded of what an extraordinary an inspiring man Nelson Mandela was 
um, and my thoughts and prayers are with him and his family right now. Thank you. As news of the death began to sink in, crowds gathered to share their grief and mock their respect. Overnight in London, it was South Africa House in Trafalgar Square which drew them. Just the start of the process of mourning for a figure whose impact on the world has surely been monumental. Bridget Kendall, BBC News. BBC News, a reminder of our main news, the death of Nelson Mandela, South Africa's first black president, was 95. He had been in increasingly poor health. President Jacob Zuma broke the news in a televised address uh, yesterday evening. He said the nation had lost its greatest son. Well, the BBC's Nicholas Witchell looks back now on an extraordinary life. His story is one of the most remarkable of any world leader. Few in history have endured oppression with such little rancor or overcome the oppressor with such little bloodshed. I, Nelson Hodesasa Mandela, do hereby swear to be faithful to the Republic of South Africa. In May 1994, Nelson Mandela, the man white South Africa had imprisoned for nearly 30 years, was sworn in as the country's first black president. Through his dignified and courageous leadership, the African National Congress had broken the stranglehold of apartheid and transformed South Africa into a multiracial democracy. Nelson Mandela was born in 1918 in South Africa's Eastern Cape. He was the son of a tribal chief. He qualified as a lawyer and by 1952 he'd set up a legal partnership with a man who was to be a lifelong friend and ally, Oliver Tambo. Together they campaigned against apartheid, the exercise in social engineering under which South Africa's white minority, in charge of the country's military as well as economic forces, brutally crushed the human rights and aspirations of the black majority. In 1956, Mandela was among 156 political activists to be charged with high treason. The trial lasted more than four years before charges were dropped. In Johannesburg, premier city of South Africa, thousands of coloured people went to attend a protest meeting called by the African National Congress. By now, black resistance to apartheid was growing. Past laws which restricted where black people could live and work became the focus of resentment. Past books were burned as Mandela and others organized demonstrations against apartheid's leaders. I despise them because they were despised by the entire world. They dressed uh, in beautiful suits, silk shirts and silk ties, but they were beautiful outside and full of evil inside. The Sharpeville massacre in 1960 forced the ANC to change strategy. 69 people died when police opened fire on black demonstrators. The ANC was outlawed, Mandela went underground, and peaceful resistance became a thing of the past. There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks on an unarmed and defenseless people. Mandela undertook a campaign of sabotage against the state. He was eventually arrested and charged with conspiracy to overthrow the government. At his trial, he made a three-hour speech from the dock. A tape of it was discovered later. This, his final plea for freedom and democracy for all South Africans, was to echo down the 27 years he was to remain a political prisoner. It is an idea for which I hope to live for and to see realized. But my Lord, if it needs be, it is an idea for which I am prepared to die. Sentenced to life imprisonment, he was sent to Robin Island, a top security prison in Cape Town's Table Bay. Photographs of Mandela were banned from publication. To quote him was an offence. But, astonishingly, he wasn't embittered by his long imprisonment. 
we soon uh, grasp the fact that uh, we are not conducting a struggle against uh, individual whites. We are fighting a principle of fighting white domination. And uh, in the course of that struggle, we can even form friendships with people from the other side. Outside, time was running out for apartheid. With the ANC leadership in jail, even the children of Soweto were now helping to sustain the revolution. The hardline government of P.W. Berta tried to crush the uprising, but gradually, more liberal white people began to recognize that Mandela was the solution, not the problem. An international campaign was begun for the release of Nelson Mandela, as around the world, governments imposed sanctions on South Africa. In 1990, a courageous white leader, President F.W. de Klerk, announced that the ANC would be unbanned. That February, after 27 years of imprisonment, Nelson Mandela walked to freedom with his then wife, Winnie, at his side. Worldwide pressure had borne fruit. But hope soon turned to despair. Township violence left blacks fighting blacks. Mandela repeatedly appealed for peace. Take your guns, your knives, and your pangas, and throw them into the sea. Mandela's appeal was largely ignored. Black people were massacring each other, even as Mandela was negotiating a new democratic constitution. The country's first multiracial elections in 1994 resulted in a landslide victory for the ANC. Millions enjoyed their first taste of democracy. People from all races welcomed the vote as a new beginning for the country. The process of national reconciliation was helped by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which gave the victims of apartheid the opportunity to tell their stories and, in some cases, to confront their oppressors. What kind of men, listening to those moans and cries and groans, what kind of men is that? It was a painful process for everyone. Yet for all his political skills, Mandela found it difficult to tackle many of South Africa's endemic social problems. Chief among them were the acute shortage of affordable housing, the widespread poverty and the scourge of AIDS. In December 1997, Nelson Mandela gave up the presidency of the African National Congress in favour of South Africa's vice president, Thabo Mbeki, who also succeeded him as head of state. Mandela was fated throughout the world, as here in London. But there'd been personal sadness. His long-time marriage to Winnie, once known as the mother of the nation, had ended following her involvement in the kidnapping and murder of a student activist. In 1998, at the age of 80, he married Grassa Michelle, the widow of the late president of Mozambique. It was a marriage which brought him personal happiness and helped him to enjoy the family life which had been denied to him by his long commitment to the struggle against apartheid. On the eve of the new millennium, Nelson Mandela had revisited the cell on Robin Island where he'd spent 18 of the 27 years he was imprisoned. He lit a candle to symbolize reconciliation. It was passed to an African child to represent that continent's hope for the future. A hope inspired by the life and ideals of one of the truly great leaders of our time, Nelson Mandela. Within the last few minutes, the Iranian president, uh, Hassan Rouhani, has expressed uh, the Iranian condolences over Ma Nelson Mandela's death. Quote, there is no doubt that Mandela's views about freedom and equality have spread all over the world. The scene now at Houghton, uh, which is uh, where the residence of Nelson Mandela is and where he died uh, about 12 hours ago. There you can see and hear the emotions of those who are gathering.
So singing the liberation songs, the songs of the struggle, it's a day to remember the past, a day to think of the future, but also a day to reflect on an extraordinary life. And let's do that now with somebody who knew that man so well, Yvonne Chaka Chaka, famous South African singer, and she joins us now from Johannesburg. So good to talk to you, Yvonne. Uh, you were somebody who was born in Soweto in 1965. Tell us how your life has been changed by Nelson Mandela. Well, I was born in Soweto in 1965, and I grew up, uh, you know, knowing the name, Nelson Mandela, your Oliver Tambos. But I think, you know, the regime was just so smart because they hid all the pictures of Nelson Mandela. We never knew how he looked like. You know, there was no book, everything was thrown away. But we were so determined because I think every black child was so conscientized. We knew that if Mandela and Oliver Tambo and Sisulu and all those leaders, Steve Biko, come into power, you know, we will, we will be freed and we will have our dignity back and you I think sang at his uh, 85th birthday you knew him I mean did you for, by that stage feel that your life had been transformed by his long walk to freedom well, by the time Nelson Mandela got released from jail, we knew that there comes freedom. I remember lying in hospital. He was released on the 11th of uh, February, and I had uh, just given birth to my son on the 10th of February. And I was lying there in hospital, and all the doctors were saying, is this little Mandela your child, my child, you know? And um, But I was very lucky because when he came out of jail, I was one of those lucky people who came, he came to my house to come and ask me to campaign for the ANC and you could never have said no to a man of my Madib of Madiba stature because we knew that he and his friends and all other leaders some even died these people are going to free us and we're all going to be able to call South Africa home as we are so it's important that today black white yellow green we should start working together and living together because this is what he anticipated this is what he wanted and this is what he taught us calling his nation a rainbow nation and Yvonne, as somebody who met him uh, on more than one occasion, as somebody who had that direct appeal from him, you talk about his stature. What do you mean by that? Give us, give us a sense of how that felt, because some people are talking about the fact that he was born to lead, he was brought up to lead, um, but others say suffering breeds greatness, and it was his suffering in prison that gave him the stature. What's, what's your view on that? I think my view is, is that, you know, Madiba was born out in the trans sky and um, as a young man he knew that everything was wrong in his country and he went and got educated he became a lawyer and he was an ed activist and a very radical uh, activist as well and but what is nice was that he was even prepared to die for this country but when he came out of jail he did not say to us let's kill the white people let's wish these people away he said we ought to be working together let's work together so for a man to do that it's gonna take another thousand years to have a man like this that he suffered he was tormented nobody believed in him everybody called him a, ter a terrorist but he came out with a smile embraced his tormentors and um, and became the leader of, 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 of South Africa and Yvonne before I let you go I have to come back to your son born the day before uh, that walk from the prison cell um, when you see the children the young children of South Africa today and of course we've seen uh, some of them last night and this morning um, thinking about Nelson Mandela do you think they understand that do you think they understand what it was like for your generation, what it was like for Nelson Mandela himself in those long, dark days and years when it wasn't clear that this was going to end as it did? Well, I think the young generation know where we come from. You know, we've got those children who were born in 94, who are called the born freeze. They don't know much about the struggle, but you know, with the television, with the books and everything, and even in our homes, we teach our children about the struggle. We want them to know where we come from, but we, they should not be dwelling on that. They should learn from that. They should know that freedom did not come very easy. Some people died, some were incarcerated, some died in exile. So the young generation know exactly what Mandela means and what he meant to us and what he means to the world. And I think we still have a lot of homework to do as well to teach our children about the struggle of this country, where we come from and where we ought to be going to. Yvonne, thanks so much for joining us. Yvonne Chaka Chaka sharing her reflections and her memories of Nelson Mandela.
and the scene at Houghton at the moment, you get the feeling there's going to be an enormous floral tribute as they read from the Bible. And you can see significant numbers of people who have gathered uh, in their distinctive green uh, to celebrate the life of Nelson Mandela, and particularly it's the ANC Women's League who are paying tribute uh, to their founder, or their joint founder of the African National Congress. Well, Nelson Mandela was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1993. He shared it with F.W. de Klerk, the last president of South Africa's whites-only apartheid regime. Well, together, they had engaged in the risky business of closed-door contacts to move forward Mandela's belief in reconciliation. Mr. de Klerk said South Africans would remember his successor as a great unifier. It's a very sad moment for the whole of South Africa and I'm sure for millions of people around the world. I fully associate myself with the dignified and, and feeling statement which President Zuma made. Uh, I've become good friends with the late Nelson Mandela. We had our moments of tension and with our political opponents. But after our retirement and at times during his presidency, we became very close. He's a, he's a remarkable man. He was a remarkable man. He, he, his biggest legacy will be his emphasis on reconciliation. His remarkable lack of bitterness. And he didn't only talk about reconciliation, he loved reconciliation. He was a great unifier. He was a great man. F.W. de Klerk, the former president, the predecessor uh, to President Mandela. Well, here in London, there was a quite surreal moment because there was the premiere of Nelson Mandela's uh, film about uh, his life, uh, A Long Road to Freedom. And it was taking place at the time that he died. Well, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge were in the audience. They were watching that film version of Nelson Mandela's autobiography, The Long Walk to Freedom. They were in that audience and they gave their reaction to the news of the former South African president's death. Um, I just want to say uh, it's obviously extremely sad and tragic news. Um, we just reminded what an extraordinary and inspiring man Nelson Mandela was. Um, and my thoughts and prayers are with him and his family right now. Well, the Duke of Cambridge uh, there, and of course, uh, a man himself with a common touch, his mother as well, and that common touch, that sense of humility and simplicity, something that Nelson Mandela is, of course, very much celebrated for and remembered for today. And that film is as much about uh, his 27 years behind bars. And during that period, Nelson Mandela became the world's most famous political prisoner. If South Africa's whites-only government had hoped he would be quietly forgotten, they were so wrong. The prison years saw Nelson Mandela's stature grow in South Africa and across the world. Our correspondent Mike Waldridge has more. For three centuries, it had been a bleak place of banishment. Nelson Mandela spent 18 of his 27 years of imprisonment on Robben Island. Some years after his release, the world's most famous political prisoner returned, together with Ahmed Kathrada, one of the ANC colleagues jailed with him. As Mr Mandela visited his old cell, the memories of incarceration were stirred. One of the things that is difficult for me to comprehend is that uh, we spent such a long time here. Mandela and his fellow prisoners worked here in the stone quarry every day, back-breaking work. They crushed rocks. The authorities hoped to crush their spirit. They were determined not to let that happen. Walter Sisulu, Nelson Mandela's oldest comrade and mentor, recalled their time there. It was Nelson who said, let's be slower than ever. It was clear, therefore, that the step we were taking would make it impossible ever to reach the quarry where we were going to. They were compelled to negotiate with Nelson. The work in the quarry became something of a power struggle. One warder even threatened to assault Mr. Mandela. I say, you dare touch me. I'll take you to the highest court in the land. And by the time I finish with you, you will be as poor as a church mouse. He then stopped. 
our general approach was that we are not going to do anything that uh, impinges on our dignity. But it went much beyond the quarry and standing up to the warders, he soon slipped into the leadership role among the prisoners. You could definitely tell that Nelson Mandela was the leader of the group. When he spoke to his colleagues, they'd stand still or work or whatever. In other words, he'd lead by example. For all the degrading and harsh aspects of life on Robben Island, it became something of an ANC university too. And it was where Nelson Mandela started work on the manuscript of his autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom. To avoid the risk of discovery, it was hidden in the prison garden. During the 1970s, events on the mainland were to have a significant impact on Robben Island. The Soweto uprising happened because of the frustration of a younger generation of black South Africans. It put some of their leaders behind bars with Nelson Mandela. We were, I think, more aggressive and uh, less polished when it came to tactical approaches. When we got Rob Nyland, for instance, there was a, a certain order of things that was there and so on. We, we disrupted a lot of things when we got there. Mandela's authority was to be crucial when his ANC colleagues learned he was talking to the government. To allay their suspicions, he told them something good may come out of it. Apartheid's rulers never tamed the man who had streets and squares around the world named after him while he was still on this forbidding island. Instead, events were to take him from prison to the presidency. And he seemed to see his life here as all part of the preparation for power. Mike Aldridge, BBC News. Well, South Africa has always been a great powerhouse in international rugby union, uh, but it was always white players, and then the first black player joined the Springboks. That player was Chester Williams, and then there was the re most remarkable in 1995, the Rugby World Cup, when the South Africans beat the All Blacks in an extraordinary final. One of those who was there was Chester Williams, the first non-white player. Chester Williams, thanks for joining us. You remember that day in 1995. You can't forget it. Yes, yes, you can't forget it, especially with the influence that Nelson Mandela had on the team and the country. You know, um, I think, firstly, if it wasn't for him, we would never have host, to be hosting the, the Rugby World Cup in South Africa. And then secondly, you know, he uh, had used this strategy to obviously to, for peace and reconciliation in South Africa. Chester, what was his influence on the team then? No, he was had a big influence on the team because he was the guy, the person that was standing, um, standing behind the team, getting the support behind the team. The black, white, whatever colour in South Africa was supporting us, and um, that they even come to training sessions to see how we train and what we're doing before and uh, our training. And uh, he was just amazing, walking into the change room uh, with a France Opinions rugby jersey on, and uh, this was before the rugby World Cup was inspirational. That moment when he presented the trophy to the South African team and you were one of them, remember that for us. Yes, it was just one of those amazing moments when uh, you handed over the trophy to Franz Pina. You watched the people around the stadium, how they were so, so happy to see uh, that Nelson Mandela handed over the trophy to them. He's looking at the faces, people crying, people are embracing each other. And it was just amazing to see um, how Nelson Mandela, one person, and, and, and the, uh, with, the, with the rest of the Springbok team, unified the country in one uh, event uh, in 1995. It must have been even more extraordinary to have a stadium packed with largely white Afrikaners erupting in delight and actually then chanting Nelson. Yes, it was just amazing to see you know, how many people were in support and, uh, and uh, what a great person he was um, at the time, you know, and, uh, and he just kind of became the big, biggest icon in the, in the world um, through his generosity and the way he lives his life, you know. He obviously lives, uh, he leaves us with a, a vision of a better life. Let us uh, honor his memories in a, in a respective manner by continuing to live his, his morals and values.
Chester, of course, this is now 18 years ago, that most remarkable moment when he presented that trophy, and you were all um, absolutely delighted, not least because you'd beaten the All Blacks. Uh, but what about the legacy that's been left for rugby and sport in South Africa? Has it lived on, that great spirit of that stadium in 1995? Uh, definitely. I mean, if you look at the, um, for, since I've been representing South Africa uh, in the Spimok team, uh, uh, there's a lot of black people already playing for the Spimok team. Currently, we've got three, four, five players in the, in the Spimok squad that is representing the country. So that legacy will continue with uh, Nelson Mandela uh, in, as, a, as a steerhead in, of, of, of the sport. And um, not only in rugby, but also in uh, other sports, soccer, cricket, all the sports that there is a, there's a lot of development. And uh, so we're very happy with the legacy that Nelson Mandela has left us here. Chester Williams, thanks very much indeed for remembering that extraordinary day in 1995 and the inspiration of Nelson Mandela on the Springbok rugby team, uh, the first non-white player for the rugby union Springboks in South Africa. And a reminder there of how Nelson Mandela changed things for so many people in so many walks of life. Uh, but let us not forget that the heart of everything was electoral politics. And so let's go back to the, the march for democracy in South Africa. When black South Africans voted for that first time in 1994, it marked the end of more than three centuries in which they had been inferior citizens in their own land. Our diplomatic correspondent, James Robbins, who was a correspondent based in South Africa at the time, he watched people queue in their millions for that election to take part in the democratic process for the first time. He's been back to find out how that day changed their lives. South African families out enjoying themselves. Now, you might not think there's anything particularly unusual about that, but to me, who reported from South Africa at the height of apartheid in the 1980s, this is something very extraordinary. This was then a whites-only suburb. I was reporting on the struggle against apartheid and the regime's extraordinarily brutal response to all and any opposition. Well, in the years since then and since Nelson Mandela's release, I've been back several times talking to ordinary South Africans, black and white, about the immense difference Nelson Mandela made to their lives. And these are some of their stories. Antoinette Peterson is still coming to terms with her terrible loss as a schoolgirl in the 1970s. Look at her screaming grief. It's June 1976 and her 13-year-old brother Hector has just been shot and killed by the police, first victim of the Soweto uprising. This museum of apartheid in Soweto is named in Hector Peterson's honour. Schoolchildren learn their violent and divided history here. For several years, Hector's sister Antoinette chose to be one of the guides to confront her own past every day and her grief. After years trying to bury it, failing to face it. She says Nelson Mandela inspired her to change. I never thought I would talk about what happened on the 16th of June, really. I never thought because every time I spoke about it, I just become traumatized, you know, confused. So I said, but Mandela went to prison for 27 years and he kept on going. Why can't I do the same? Next, the story of Herman Bailey. I met him in 2004. In the Cape Winelands, the mayor of Wellington is showing some of the riches of South Africa to the Japanese ambassador, drumming up business for the non-racial rainbow nation which Nelson Mandela did so much to create. Under apartheid, Herman, then classified as Cape Coloured, could never have been mayor of a wealthy town ruled by the white minority. Well, I think it's the values of the man, Nelson Mandela. Uh, to have been incarcerated all those years and to come out and in his very first speech he said, let bygones be bygones. I think no South African uh, who was uh, at the time very influenced by the then government could have believed that this is the words of somebody who's been incarcerated for so long. Now meet Chris Vessels, another prisoner of apartheid. This is Khanadendal, or the Valley of Grace, further east in the Cape. Back in 1738, it was the first Christian mission station in South Africa. Much more recently, this is a community which resisted apartheid, causing Nelson Mandela to name his Cape Town home after the village. 
Chris Vessels was pastor of the church here. He was imprisoned in the 1970s for daring to oppose white supremacy. 69 days in solitary confinement almost killed him. Nelson Mandela's example kept him going. I just got the feeling that I would never come out alive. Sitting there with my thoughts, I thought, I wonder what Nelson Mandela was doing at that time. Having been there for so many years, separated from his family, uh, uh, how he could endure uh, such torture uh, to be separated from the community for so many years. Here I sat for only a few months and, uh, and yet it was so hard, it was so difficult. It was practically unbearable, and that gave me strength. Hedwig van der Merwe is our last witness to Nelson Mandela's greatness. If you feel uncomfortable, or you have done something that... Hedwig is a school teacher who used to believe Nelson Mandela was a terrorist, to be feared, not admired. Hedwig van der Merwe's pupils were exclusively white until the mid-1990s. Now she rejoices in the change to multiracial education. But back then, she was really scared when Nelson Mandela was freed from prison. Was it going to be safe for, South, for white South Africans? Uh, you know, will, will we be able to move around the way we used to? Are we now going to be thrown into jail because we're white? He started talking and, and sort of reassured people that this country is now going to work together and there's never, ever going to be a thing like apartheid in South Africa. That set our minds at rest. The stories of just a handful of South Africans who lived through the worst of times. There are thousands, probably millions of other South Africans who have similar stories to tell. And they help explain why, for them, Nelson Mandela was such a hero. Not the only hero, 